Your Excellency, good morning and thank you for granting LifeSite News this interview this beautiful morning in Rome. A couple of days ago you've published uh, your guidelines for implementing Amoris Laetitiae in your uh, diocese. Amoris Laetitiae is seen by many in the media uh, also individually as a break with church tradition and discipline. What would you say about that? The very simple answer is no. It is not a break uh, with uh, the sacred tradition of the church. It can't be. Uh, and Amoris Laetitia uh, can only be read and can only be interpreted in the light of the larger tradition and the teaching of the church, both in sacred scripture and in the sacred tradition of the church. This is, this is how we always read and interpret any document uh, that comes from the Holy See. Uh, and including uh, a post-synodal apostolic exhortation of the Holy Father. Um, he teaches in continuity with uh, the, the tradition of the Church. And so as we receive this document from our Holy Father, uh, we receive it with joy, we receive it with a great openness, but we also receive it and read it and interpret it and then apply it in continuity with the perennial teaching of the church with regard to all aspects of uh, marriage and family life, which of course is, is the subject of uh, the exhortation. So I, I, I firmly, firmly believe that we, we cannot see Amoris Laetitiae as a, a break or a rupture with the teaching that has preceded it, but I think the teaching that has preceded it must then shed light on our own reading and interpretation uh, of the document. So, no, it, 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 it is not and cannot be uh, a break with uh, the tradition and the, and the teachings of our church. In Amoris Laetitia, many specific situations are being addressed. And it seems to be suggested that in those situations, the individual or the spiritual director should decide in his conscience what would be the best thing to do. Now. Is the conscience infallible? No, conscience is not infallible. In fact, we know that, that conscience can be an error. Um, uh, sometimes a person is not uh, culpable uh, for the error that, that uh, their conscience dictates to them. Uh, there can be ignorance, uh, and, and sometimes there can be um, invincible ignorance, that, that, that a person simply does not know. Um, their conscience has not been formed uh, according to truth and according to, to the teachings of the church. So, no, conscience, the, the mistake that, that we make uh, with conscience is that some uh, are, try to see conscience as a law unto itself, as we say. Um, that, that conscience is so supreme that uh, it, it is in, indeed a law unto itself without uh, focusing on the very important uh, part of how we use and exercise our conscience, and that is the formation of our conscience. Our conscience, it does guide us. And I, I think what, what has created some of this difficulty is that in, in the documents of the Second Vatican Council, there was a great emphasis on, on the role of conscience. Um, and it is that, that voice of God speaking in the depth of the heart of, of the human person and so we are bound to follow that, that voice. Uh, so it is true that we are bound to obey our conscience because our conscience dictates to us uh, that which is right and that which is wrong. But our conscience must be properly formed, informed. In other words, uh, we have to take uh, the teachings of Christ and we have to take the teachings of the church and we have to use those teachings to educate our conscience, to form it, so that when we make judgments of conscience, we are making those judgments in conformity with the divine law. And uh, the mistake that I think many are, are making, especially with regard to the application of, of Amoris Laetitiae, is uh, they are emphasizing the supremacy of conscience, but some are, I think, emphasizing it sort of as a law unto itself. The teachings of Christ and the teachings of the church um, are truth. And we must conform our conscience to the truth. We must form our conscience according to the mind of Christ 
and to the teachings of the church, which are Christ's teachings. Uh, Jesus Christ promised the gift of the Holy Spirit to his church to lead us into all truth. One of my favorite passages of scripture is where Jesus has been instructing the apostles and he says, this much I have told you now that I am with you. I have much more to tell you, but I cannot tell you now because you could not bear it. You, you really could not absorb it. When I go, I will send you the spirit, the spirit of truth, and he will lead you into all truth. So the teachings of the church are not simply human teachings so that we can sort of consider them uh, when forming our conscience as sort of one piece of information that we take in the formation of our conscience. These are the teachings of Christ. You cannot separate Jesus from his church as some uh, I, I think would try to do. Jesus and his church are one and this is a fatal mistake that that so many make today. You know we hear statements like well you know I know the church teaches X but Jesus and then they somehow place Jesus in opposition to the teachings of his church. But, but the, the church is the mystical body of Christ. The church is the mystical presence of Christ in the world. The church exercises that ongoing mission of Christ for the salvation of the world. It is the universal sacrament of salvation. So we must look to the teachings of Christ as recorded in sacred scripture and as given to us in the tradition with a capital T, the magisterial teaching of the church that is what must inform our conscience. And so when we are going to make moral choices, we do those properly knowing what the truth is, what God asks of us, what God demands of us. And then we seek to conform our lives to that. Now we're weak and we're human beings and we sin. We all sin. I am a sinner. Um, but that doesn't mean that I say that the teachings of the church are wrong because I cannot fully live up to them. I seek with the help of God's grace to, to conform my life and the, the moral choices I make to those teachings of Christ, but I don't say that the, the teachings of Christ and the church are not for me, uh, that I have formed my conscience according to other principles. For Catholics, sanctity is a vocation for everybody. Sanctity requires heroic virtue. So is everybody called to heroic virtue? Is that really something realistic to ask of every individual from the church? God would never demand of us and ask of us that which is impossible. He loves us too much. You know, God is a God of, of, of infinite love. God is, is, is a God of infinite mercy. Uh, he loves us more than we love ourselves. He has more concern for our happiness than we do. Uh, and so God would never ask of us or demand of us that which is impossible. Um, he does call us to holiness. He does call us to a life of heroic virtue. All of us, not just the, the, the saints that we know, but, but you and me, we are called to the heights of holiness, to the heights of sanctity. Um, and, you know, th this, is the, this is the call of every Christian. You know, the Second Vatican Council uh, in Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church, spoke powerfully of that universal call to holiness, that we are all called to holiness according to our own state in life and our own vocation, that the call to holiness is not just for you know, priests and religious and bishops and, and the Pope, but every disciple of Christ is called to holiness, uh, married couples, single people. We are all called to the heights of sanctity and, you know, uh, yes, we, we, some of us get closer to that than, than others, and we recognize some that have clearly achieved heroic virtue, uh, and we call them saints. But there are many saints who have never been officially canonized by the church. I've known some of those people. I've had some of those people sit across from me in the confessional, people that are far holier than I am, and I am inspired by their heroic witness. And God gives us the grace to achieve those, those, those heroic virtues. Um, we can't excuse ourselves. We can't say, I'm too weak, or that's too much. Um, we must strive continually to grow in holiness day by day, and God gives us every grace that we need. He gives us his word uh, upon which to meditate. He gives us the, the beautiful teachings entrusted to his bride, the church. Uh, we have the, 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 the infinite graces of the sacraments 
We have uh, the sacrament of penance where we can confess our sins and be reconciled and receive grace to strengthen us against our, our struggles with sin. We receive Jesus Christ himself, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most holy Eucharist. There can be no greater uh, source of grace than that. It is, it is Christ himself. The entire uh, spiritual good of the church is contained in the Eucharist. We have our own prayer uh, where we take our struggles to, to the Lord. And, and in marriage, uh, marriage is a sacrament. And there is a grace of the sacrament. What is the grace of the sacrament of marriage? It is precisely the grace to live out this state in life in fidelity to that which Christ calls us to. Um, the grace of the sacrament of marriage isn't just received on the day of the wedding. It is a grace that perdures throughout the marriage because the, the outward sign of the sacrament of marriage is the covenant itself. The covenant of marriage becomes a rich and inexhaustible source of grace upon which uh, couples can draw in their daily struggles to live faithfully uh, their, their call to marriage. So the call to holiness is, is, uh, is not something beyond us. Uh, God calls us to it, but then he gives us everything that we need uh, to achieve it in our own lives. Now, as Bishop, you have published a document uh, to implement Amoris Laetitia in your diocese. As a pastor, what did you say in the document and also, what counsel would you give individual priests that approach you with certain questions? I, well, first, on, on, on your first part of the question, in uh, number 300 of Amoris Laetitiae, uh, the Holy Father instructs the priests uh, to uh, deal with the particular cases that, that come before them as pastors, to deal with them in light of church teaching and the guidelines of the local bishop. And um, so following uh, our Holy Father's exhortation there, I myself have begun to, to issue guidelines for my local church, uh, just, just for my own archdiocese for which I am the pastor and, and, and I am responsible for. Um, so I, I've issued a, a, the first part of my, my attempt to provide guidance uh, to the local church, especially the pastors, uh, through, through my pastoral uh, letter, A True and Living Icon, where I lay out first the moral principles that must be applied and followed uh, in, in reading and using Amoris Laetitiae. Uh, the letter really is in response to what I perceive as some misuses of certain passages in Amoris Laetitiae, which uh, have been misconstrued and used in ways that actually contradict the, the, the perennial teachings of the church. Um, so my, my pastoral letter is, is primarily to address those issues, to, to lay a foundation um, of understanding so we know the foundation upon which we are going to apply uh, Maurice Laetitiae in the diocese um, in, in all cases. I'm going to be following up with uh, that letter with some specific guidelines now. I, want, I wanted the people and the priests to have a chance to absorb uh, the pastoral letter first and to get that good foundation uh, in, in our moral understanding of how we approach even difficult uh, pastoral situations. And then following uh, very soon, I will issue some specific guidelines uh, which will, will, will guide especially the priests in the application. Now, when it comes to difficult cases, and there are some very, very painful and difficult cases that people find themselves in, and the Holy Father certainly is exhorting us uh, to mercy, uh, to compassion, to accompaniment. Um, and, you know, I, I quote our Holy Father's famous expression uh, in my pastoral letter that the church must be like a field hospital, binding up the wounds, of those whose lives have been so broken. Um, so we mustn't apply uh, the teachings of Christ and the teachings of the church uh, in, a, in a harsh or, um, or, or judgmental sort of way. The Holy Father really is exhorting us to compassion and mercy. We must accompany these people and help them draw closer and closer and closer to the truth. So, you know, when priests in, in my diocese, if they come to me, you know, my, my uh, uh, counsel to them would be to treat all of these folks who find themselves in, in very painful and difficult situations with the greatest of compassion, with the greatest of understanding, to accompany them, but to also to show them the truth, to not shy away from the truth. 
the truth of their own situation. You know, I don't think it's mercy uh, to, to not tell someone the truth and to help them then accept that truth, to integrate that truth more and more into their own lives as they seek uh, on that path to holiness to live according to the Lord's ways. Um, you know, there's a gradualism, not a gradualism of the law, in that the law gradually applies more and more to a person. The law always applies, the moral law I'm talking about, the Christ law. Um, but we sinners, perhaps gradually, uh, come to that, that full understanding and that full ability with God's grace to, to live the truth that is revealed to us in, in the teachings of Christ in the church. So my, my, my counsel would be, you know, because I've dealt with these situations myself as a pastor, um, many difficult situations, with great gentleness, with, with great kindness, with great compassion, you show someone the truth, and then you help them and accompany them uh, to, to be able to live fully up to that truth. The world's attention is focused on your country right now and on the upcoming elections. Mm, as a Catholic, uh, every individual is faced with the decision to make. Um, what would be your counsel and your suggestion for the upcoming elections for Catholics? Well, I would start by saying that, that you know, at least in my lifetime, uh, as long as I've been voting for the office of president, there's never been a perfect candidate. I think we have to start there. I have yet to see a candidate who perfectly lines up, if you will, with the principles that should guide a, a, a Catholic conscience in casting vote. Here's another, here's another example of forming our consciences for faithful citizenship. Um, according to the, to the teachings of the church, on the moral issues, <clears throat> you know, nobody's talking about imposing our, our Catholic faith or our religious practices on the rest of society, but when it comes to the moral issues that form and shape the culture and the society in which we live, we need to be guided by, the, again, the teachings of Christ in the church on, on moral issues. I've yet to see a candidate who perfectly lines up uh, on those issues. The, all candidates are flawed in some way or another. Um, I don't think it's, it's going beyond the pale to say that in this particular election, we, in my mind, have two particularly flawed candidates, uh, neither of which um, fully you know, exemplifies what we would hope for, quite honestly, in a leader for our country. And I, and I say that sadly. Um, so um, I guess as, as I would, my advice would be as, you, as, as, as citizens, as Catholic citizens, look at these two candidates, I think my advice would be to, to somehow get, get beyond the, the, the face, get beyond the, the people themselves and look behind that in terms of what are the policies that these candidates are most likely to implement uh, were they to become the president of our country. Um, look at what their stand is on the issues of greatest importance uh, to us in the, in the culture in the United States. What are their positions on life? especially the protection of the lives of the unborn, um, the elderly. I come from a state in the United States that has physician-assisted suicide. Um, so what is their stand on those all-important life issues, which are the foundation issues in, in, in any election, uh, the, the respect for the dignity of human life? Uh, what is their position on marriage and family, uh, the, the, the fabric, the, the, the foundation for a healthy society. What is their position on, on, on the, the, the nature of marriage? Uh, what is their position on, on a great threat to us in the United States, the church I mean, and that's our religious liberty. Uh, in the United States, uh, the religious liberty of all people, not just Catholics, is, is under real attack. Uh, so I would ask uh, citizens to look who is most likely to, to have policies and the like that are going to protect the religious liberty of the citizens of our great land. Um, one thing that is a particular concern to me is the Supreme Court. Uh, there will be vacancies. There's one now. And there are likely to be more vacancies on our Supreme Court uh, during the, the term of the next president. Um, I would ask citizens to look at what kind of judges are most likely to be appointed to the High Court uh, by these two candidates um, in light of, of the, the primary issues that are facing us today. I, I fear um, that 
if, if, if certain uh, type of judge, judges are appointed to the Supreme Court, if cases come before the court that uh, bear upon our religious liberty as Catholics in this country and our institutions to live freely and fully our faith, I, I have a great concern about that. So I, I think we need to get behind the, 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 the facade of these two very flawed individuals and, and look at what is likely to happen during the potential presidency of these two and, and let that be our guide. Well, thank you, Your Excellency, for taking your time today and for granting this interview. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>